All right, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. I am joined by a special guest today. We have Dr. Michael Pariser on the show. Uh, Dr. Pariser is a psychotherapist and change agent who is passionate about solving life, pro life problems using emotional intelligence. He's the author of No More Mr. Nice Guy, The Hero's Journey. So I originally uh, kind of came across the, the book, no More Mr. Nice Guy by uh, Robert Glover, which is a book that really uh, changed my life as I was just uh, telling Dr. Priester before we started the show. But we're going to talk about all that sort of stuff on the show today and, and kind of go over uh, some of those concepts and, and expand on those concepts uh, based on some of the, the work that you've done, Dr. Priester. So I'm really excited to, to be joined by you on the show today. Hey, it's... Uh... It's really nice to be here, and it's really nice to be talking about this stuff because I, uh, I, it's life changing for me as well, and I, I think it can be for a lot of guys out there. Absolutely. So let's let's first for for people who haven't heard the the term before or not exactly sure what the term means. How would you define what what is a nice guy? A nice guy is actually not all that nice. A nice guy is somebody who believes, it's more about the inner structure. It's more about a belief that if I am at least superficially nice, if I'm nice to everybody, if I put everybody else's needs first and hold mine off, um, if I'm never selfish, if I'm never unkind, if I do for others, then without asking, I'm going to get all the love I'm looking for and live a problem-free existence. And it doesn't work. But that's what a nice guy is. Got it. So basically someone who's, who's they're not really nice, as you're saying, they're just doing behaviors that up, they're, they're trying to people please in order to gain other people's approval without sort of, you know, getting their own needs met? Well, not without getting their own needs met, but without asking for their needs to be met. In other words, the, the whole project, the nice guy project is, I'm gonna make you happy and then I'm gonna wait and you're gonna make me happy. I'm not gonna ask for it because that's selfish, right? I'm not going to ask for it because that would make me look, you know, kind of needy. I'm just going to wait and you're supposed to figure out what I want and give it to me. Right. I see what you're saying. So what, what originally kind of sparked your interest in, was it Dr. or uh, uh, Robert Glover's book uh, that you read and then wanted to get into that work? Or what, what originally kind of got you into this whole space and then inspired you to want to write a book of your own? Well, precisely. It, it, I read uh, Robert's book, Dr. Glover's book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And um, when I wrote it, like you, it was like, you know, the, all the light bulbs went on. I, I, the way I think about it was that I, I, I was in therapy at the time and I was working on all my problems and I thought I had this problem, that problem, the other problem. Like, and it felt like I, the, my problems were this swarm of bees that were stinging me from all sides. And then I read the book and I realized that all the bees were connected, that there was a hive someplace and a queen bee who looked a lot like my mother. Um, and in your case, your mother, and like all the problems are connected. And so I, I shifted gears in therapy and I started working on this kind of central, uh, kind of nice guy way of being. And then I started making progress that I had never made before. And as I did this, I thought, well, you know, I'm a therapist. I can help people. And um, I, I started a monthly workshop, and um, it's still going eight years later. I started it in 2013. It's now the end of 2020. It's seven years, I guess. 
guess, seven or eight years. And, um, uh, and then I started doing that work on an individual basis with guys. And there was a common experience and complaint that they all had. They all had the same experience that you and I had. They read Robert Glover's book and they went, wow, that's me. You know, he, he really nailed me. He got me. I, that's me. I confess. I've been doing all of this stuff. But what do I do about it? And if you've read his, Dr. Glover's book, you know that he's got these things called breaking free activities and they're kind of cool, but they're, they, they kind of pale in comparison with his understanding. And so I said to him, he's become a, he became a friend of mine and he used to, I, li I used to live on a boat. I just moved off and he would come up to Los Angeles and stay on the boat with me and we would hang out and talk about things. And I said to him one day, you know, a lot of guys have this issue with your book. You need to write a workbook to go along with it. And he said, I don't want to. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it with you. We'll do it together. And he said, I don't want to. And so he said, you go write it. And that's how it, that was the genesis of, of the book. He told me, go write the book. So I wrote the book. And it started out as a workbook, but gradually it got to be more, it's still workbook E, but it's still, it's got some other stuff that comes out of my experience. It's got additional chapters that aren't in his book. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really a kind of a roadmap to go from nice guy to kind of solid, good, assertive, integrated, honest, authentic male. So the, the nice guys, like when, you know, they, they come in to see you, they, they obviously, you know, are, are coming into therapy. They realize that there's a problem. What, what, are, what are some of the, the issues that nice guys that you commonly see that they face? Well, first of all, their lives don't work. Um, they don't get what they want. And they don't know why they don't get what they want. Because they have this formula in their head. If I make other people happy, they're going to give me what I want without me asking for it. But they don't. Sometimes it's, it's they, they don't even know. They don't, they, they don't even know that I want something, much less, you know, have the wherewithal to give it to me. Sometimes they don't want to give it to me. Sometimes it's in, in conflict with what they have. But mostly, nice guys don't get what they want because they don't ask for it. They don't know what it is and they don't ask for it. The second reason that nice that guys don't get what they want is they don't really command much in the way of respect. In particular, nice guys don't, aren't satisfied with their romantic relationships. And, um, you know, the bad boys all get the girls. Well, yeah, w women don't want nice guys. They're like little boys. And so women, it's not that women don't want anything to do. There's certain women who do, but for the most part, nice guys don't get the, the, the kind of magnetic attraction that a, a, a solid man will get. And they're always running after women and trying to make something happen, which doesn't work very well. And what are some of the, the, the sort of common is it like a lot of stuff to do with, with their childhood or kind of social conditioning? Like what, what caused them to sort of have these, these issues in terms of romantic relationships or asking for what they want? Like why, why do you think uh, that these problems sort of developed in the way that they did? Hmm. Yes, childhood, absolutely. Um, as a rule, most guy, nice guys come from families where they are asked to take a particular role in, re, 
relation, generally speaking, to one parent, but it it is ultimately both. Generally speaking, there is one parent who is so emotionally fragile or needy that the family is organized around not upsetting that person. So it could be a father who is rageful or angry or drunk. It could be a mother who is anxious or depressed. And so like, don't make mommy anxious or don't make daddy, don't piss daddy off because he'll, he'll put his fist through the wall. Um, and so, and everybody knows this. And it doesn't matter if you're an only child or if you're one of 12 children. There's a, there's a family rule that says, this is how I need to be in order to make my parent happy and then in turn get what I want. Um, and so uh, that's what nice guys learn to do. They learn to take care of the parent and um, ultimately their own sense of desire, their own sense of what do I want gets obliterated. And it sounds like their, their sort of self-worth is sort of dependent on, you know, maybe this parent's approval, which they can only get if they behave in certain ways that are going to get the approval. It's not that's right. a sort of conditional love, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. If I make, if you're my, if you're my father and I make you happy or I make you proud, then you'll be, you'll say nice things and my self-esteem will go up. But if you're pissed off at me and tell me what an idiot I am, um, then my self-esteem will go down. Yes. Got it. So what are the, what, what happens when a, you know, kind of a nice guy comes in to, to sort of seek help? Like what are the steps as far as uh, sort of either identifying the behaviors and then eventually getting to a point where you can change them? How does that, can you kind of lead me through that process? To the best of my ability, yeah. <laughs> Let's assume for argument's sake that this, uh, uh, our nice guy has read Dr. Glover's book, as opposed to, I have to uh, introduce him to the idea. But he's read the book and he calls me up and he says, I'm a nice guy, I read Dr. Glover's book, oh my God, what am I gonna do about it? And he comes in to see me and we start to work on it. And uh, the first, few sessions are going to be all about the kinds of question you just asked, which is, how does it manifest? What's going wrong in your life that's based on, and then I start telling them stories about the, you know, serial relationships that didn't work and the porn that they spend hours looking at, or the fact that they lied and cheated, or they got nowhere, they're getting nowhere in their careers or whatever it happens to be there, all of their pains and aches and frustrations that, uh, and we spend some time kind of tying it together um, and looking at how the nice guy dynamics play out and have caused this. So then, um, we start working on the underlying emotional issues that are driving the nice guy behavior. Um, so we work on the idea that um, uh, it's wrong to be selfish, or it's wrong to ever put your needs first. Um, we work on getting to know what you want because most nice guys their the whole process of knowing what they want is is not it's not working so it's it's there it has to come back online it's what i call reanimating desire it's about it's about learning to get hold of what you want before you go out and try to make other people happy um and we start to and we work on the anxiety of doing that and the fear that 
guys won't, that they won't be accepted, that people won't like them if they change. People, if I say I want Chinese food tonight, you won't like me. I will, you'll only like me if I say, where, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? So we start reanimating desire and we start getting hold. In order to do that, we start getting hold of emotions. So I work on helping guys get in touch with how they feel what they like and what they want. And then starting to act on that with one more important element, which is radical honesty. So there's a radical acceptance of who I am, that's what we're working towards, including all my feelings, and a radical honesty in relation to other people, letting them know who I am and what I want how I feel. Right. And it, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is, is sort of this, this lack of, of kind of acceptable uh, acceptance seeking behavior where, where it's more so instead of trying to figure out, you know, where does this person want to go to eat? Like, you know, just saying your own desires and realizing that your own kind of self-worth is not dependent on what that other person thinks of, you know, what you're saying, just kind of, um, right. I guess, sort of just being more, as, as you're saying, kind of just authentic. And, and something that I've found, I don't know, I, I would assume this is a common experience, is that the more true to myself and authentic that I've become in my life, actually, the more people that gravitate towards me. It's like, the, the less, amazing? The less it's I'm trying just, to, to get it's friends. It's just or the to, opposite exactly. of what nice guys think. Right. Is that, so that's a common experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only, yeah, and they gravitate because they, they like, people like honest people. Don't you gravitate towards honest people? 100%. And gravitate towards men who are self-accepting, who can just stand there and say, you know, I want a steak tonight. Um, and, or I want to go to, you know, Thailand for a vacation or whatever it is, or I want to be with that person. And, and without, without apology, without hesitation or apology, this is what I want. And there's an interesting thing that goes on. Nice guys have all this kind of secret manipulation going on. I really want Chinese food, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say, where do you want to go? And you're gonna say sushi. And I, oh, Asian food. That's interesting. You know, I don't know that there's any good sushi places, but like, you know, I, I heard there might be this interesting. Like, uh, uh. Whereas <laughs> somebody else will just go, I want Chinese food. And you're right, my self-esteem doesn't depend on whether or not you think Chinese food is a good thing to eat. Um, you may not want to eat Chinese food. That's a whole other issue. You have, you're a human being too, and you have your own desires, and we can talk about them and negotiate. But it, my self-esteem is not going to rise and fall on whether or not you like my dinner suggestion. Right. Uh, you know, a concept that I, I've been thinking about or thought about in the past is, is sort of the idea that it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're social creatures. So it's like we, we, we do, there is this need for other people's, you know, love or acceptance. It's like, we can't be completely on an island, most of us, but at the same time, it's like trying to, to get that by, by focusing on getting those other people's approval is not the way to, to get those needs met. Is that it's funny, isn't it? It's true. I, you're absolutely right, in my opinion. Um, you don't you don't get it by going after it. It you get it by going after what you want and the rest comes to you. And not only does it come to you, it comes in the form of the people who um, like who you are. Um, Nice guys want everybody to like them. 
But I, at this point in my life, I don't need everybody to like me. The people who like me like me, and the people who don't like me don't like me. And my self-esteem isn't dependent on the fact that this person likes me and that person doesn't. Right. So, so yeah, you don't go after it. It just comes to you. Right. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting phenomena. Yeah. So tell me tell me about you know your your work with this this book the uh, No More Mister Nice Guy the Hero's Journey. You're talking about sort of the, the a, a workbook, um, but building into other stuff, I guess too. How does this, um, I guess, sort of build off of uh, Doctor Glover's work? Like what what did you can you elaborate on like what you like what this what was sort of missing that that you thought like needed to be expanded upon like you know in in your book hmm. well when i first started out i didn't think anything needed to be added to conceptually i just thought that there should be a series of exercises that more like his breaking free activities but it's it grew over time so here's what got added um Exercises that weren't there. There's about there's about 13, 14, 15 chapters. Each one it is an average of four exercises. So there's more than in his book. And each exercise I lay out step with step-by-step -step instructions. So you kind of know exactly what to do. And an example of somebody that did it. And so that hopefully it it takes you through the exercise in a way that's easy to do and understandable. There's also kind of my understanding, like there's what Dr. Glover talks about, and then there's my insights coming from seven years of psychotherapy working with nice guys. Um, Tell me about like more of uh, kind of what those insights are. All right. Um, before that, I want to, I mean, there's still a couple things I, I want to add to the last question. Then there is, uh, there are several chapters that are not in his book. So there's a chapter, an introductory, I mean, a, a kind of a prep chapter on, it's about getting in touch with feelings and other things. There's a chapter on assertiveness. There's a chapter on ending. There's, so there's additional chapters that aren't in his book. And then finally, there's the hero's journey part of it, which is that um, this thing is designed to take you step by step, exercise by exercise, chapter by chapter, through an entire transformational experience that will probably, you know, to get through the book, probably six months to a year. It's not a reading book. It really is a working book. Um, and it's designed to take you on your own transformative journey that gets you ultimately where you want to go. It, it's a, it, it really does answer the, try to answer the question, okay, I get it. This is who I am. How do I change and get to be who I want to be? Awesome. And then going back to that question about kind of the, the insights that, that you saw kind of in your own psychotherapy practice that may have differed from Dr. Glover's, what, what sort of stuff did you notice? It wasn't that it differed so much as it elaborated. Um, and with different emphases. So the thing that I think it's mentioned a little bit in Dr. Glover's book, but for me is central, has to do with um, a kind of a core narrative, which Dr. Glover refers to as toxic shame, which is a concept he got from John Bradshaw. Um, in his book, Healing the Shame That Binds You. But for me, it's much more central. It's not just shame. It's a depressive narrative. 
that that goes essentially that was created in childhood that goes essentially i am there's something wrong with me there's something fundamentally inherently wrong with me. I'm stupid, ugly, toxic, rotten, bad. It's in my DNA. I can't change it. There's nothing I can do about it. And it renders me unlovable and unfit for human company. I have to hide it from everybody because this is the essential truth about me. Lots of people have this, by the way. And um, if you look in the, the DSM, you know what the DSM is? The, the, the diagnostic manual with all the mental disorders, right? right? It's the kind of Bible for the psychotherapy uh, profession. There's what are called personality disorders. So there's narcissistic personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder and avoidant personality. Well, this is essentially, I don't consider them disorders. I consider them large scale personality organizations that are kind of rigid, which is their problem. And, um, uh, but designed to get you what you want. The nice guy is a personality disorder. It's a person, it's a personality organization that is designed to get somebody what he wants um, uh, in a consistent kind of a way. And it's under, and all of these personality organizations are layered on top of, I am defective and unlovable. So therefore I have to do X. A narcissist will have to uh, be above everybody else and have them worship him. Histrionic, they'll have to be on stage and everybody is applauding. A uh, nice guy has to be loved and admired for his goodness and selflessness. And that's how he's going to get through the world. Um, and, but once we take that away, what's left that the nice guy has to face is that underlying core conviction that, that I am shamefully bad, toxically defective, unchangeable, and therefore unlovable. And Nice guys have to go out. We all, all, every patient I ever saw had this in some form or another. And you have to go out and you have to try to face the world in a different kind of a way where you are not unlovable and see what happens next. Relating to the, the concept of, of the sort of toxic shame that you're talking about, it's something that I, I was having a conversation with a friend a few weeks ago about uh, the sort of idea that you know, it, if you're hide like the, if you're hiding something, and you're 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 sort of the way I view it is sort of devoting all these sort of neural mental resources to sort of hiding a certain aspect of yourself that that you feel is like toxic. I feel like people are very people are more perceptive than maybe we give them credit for. I feel like like in my own life where it was like I could sort of. I was definitely hiding certain things about my personality, but then I think that sort of caused other people anxiety, you know, who, who I was relating to because they could notice like, what is this person hiding, which in turn made them anxious, which in turn pushed them away from me. Mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of how I see that, that kind of concept playing out and how it, it has caused problems like in my own life. Yeah, you know, I like what you're saying a lot. The way the way I, I want to just kind of add to it, which is that um, I don't think people are perceptive enough to sort out the content necessarily. Like, oh, he must be thinking he hates himself and he's a defective loser who, right, will never get a girl. He, he's not, they, they're not that perceptive. Um, but 
they, they feel something. They can feel in their bones that something's not right. They're, that what you're asking, um, it produces discomfort. So um, uh, if you say to me, where do you want to go for dinner? And I say, I'd like sushi. And I don't get a, like, I start to get like kind of pushed into a corner. Oh, sushi, so you must want Chinese food. Um, I, I'm like, something's wrong here. I may not be perceptive enough to figure out that you're a nice guy who actually wanted Chinese food to begin with. And that's why you're doing, and you had a specific restaurant in mind, and, and but you were afraid to tell me. I may not be that perceptive, but I will feel uncomfortable like I'm being, I'm being squeezed out of my own freedom. Right. Yeah, that that's definitely yeah something that, that I totally one hundred percent agree with. Um, so I guess let's let's talk about. So w can you give me some like examples of like you know some of the exercises in this workbook and like maybe I guess for the audience you know some of the people who've maybe read Dr. Glover's book maybe some people who haven't but but what sort of what sort of like practical uh, tools can people sort of implement? Hmm. So good question. So one of one of my favorites right from the beginning in terms of reanimating desire, which is a central, uh, you know, kind of shift that a, a nice guy has to make is um, has to do we're talking restaurants. So it, it's it's a simple thing that guys can do. You're going out on a date or you're taking your partner to dinner. Um, what do nice guys do? Where do you want to go? What do you want for dinner? Right? They may already like some have some idea, but you're not allowed to do that. In the exercise, you can only, you must go off by yourself so that you don't have any ab other people's voices and you have to figure out where you want to go for dinner. And it can take you a half an hour, an hour, two hours, doesn't matter. Lock yourself in the bedroom, take a walk around the neighborhood, uh, sit in your car, whatever it takes, you have to say what you want for dinner. And you can't cheat. The cheat is where would she like to go for dinner? Or I, boy, I'd really like to go for Italian tonight, but she's on a diet and she's not going to want lasagna. So I won't say it. I'll say sushi, even though, I mean, I like sushi, but I really want, no, you have, if this were your last day on earth, where would you eat? Um, if this other person didn't exist, where would you go to dinner? That's how it has to be. And once you know, that's step one. Step two, you have to go to the person and say, I want fill in the blank. I want Chinese food tonight. And then you have to shut the fuck up and wait and see what happens next. And just stand there. It's going to be really hard. That even though it's only going to be a second or two, you, ha you, ha you will have to stop yourself from saying things like, but if you, if you don't like the, the Chinese, then we could go, like, well, like, what do you want? you got to stop yourself from saying that shit. You have to shut up and wait for the response. And then when you get the response, then you have to deal with it. And so you're going to need to learn that a it does, you're not going to be punished for wanting italian food occasionally you get punished like if you say hey let's go have a steak Let, i want to take you to big steak dinner and she says i'm a vegan all right and if she then says how dare you how could you <laughs> then you're with the wrong woman anyway but um it's not going to work but um if if generally speaking the other person says okay 
like about eight times out of 10, they say, okay. Um, if they don't, then you negotiate. And this nice guys have to learn how to do this too. And it's in the book. Um, if, you, if I say, let's go have Chinese and you say, no, I want Italian, then okay, then we negotiate. So, okay, how about if you come with me tonight for Chinese and tomorrow I'll take you for Italian or to, I'll have Italian tonight, but you got to promise me next time we go for Chinese. Okay. Or we go to an Italian Chinese restaurant or we go to a food court. You have uh, Italian and I'll have Chinese. Or we say, the hell with that, we go have uh, sushi someplace. Or we stay home and cook omelets. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just, that's just the negotiation part. The hard part is just to stand, it's what I like to call standing in the vulnerability of your own desire. And it sounds like really, uh... What you're saying is really kind of a simplification. I mean, it's almost a lot less sort of mental work to not not have to be like trying to figure out what is going to please this other person and, you know, think, oh, she likes this, but doesn't like this. But we went here last. Like, there's so much sort of mental work that goes into that. Whereas like, if you're just like, all right, I want this and I'm going to ask for this. I mean, it it seems like not only is it a better way to get where you want, but it just, it's just, it's so much simpler. It is a lot simpler. It's a lot simpler. I, that's a good point. I, I like what you're saying. It is a lot simpler. Um, and, um, and the responses that come back are, are simpler also. It doesn't get complicated. Um, I, when I was younger, this stuff would happen all the time. I, I, I would go some, you know, I would say, well, where do you want to go for dinner? And a woman would say, fill in the blank, you know, sushi. So we would go to sushi and then I would be complaining about the sushi. And ultimately I would say something like, well, you know, sometimes I didn't really want to go for sushi anyway. So how did that make her feel? Right. Um, it just all got very complicated. Now I just go, I want this. And she says, I want this. And then we sort it out. And yes, it's much simpler. Right. And I guess that, that almost sounds like that sort of uh, maybe passive aggressiveness can set in where it's like, if you, if you don't ask what you want and you go along with something, like you're going to kind of take that anger out potentially and, in sort of unhealthy ways like it's gonna yeah. you know you'll you're show not, you're up not going late, to be... you'll forget the date you'll right you'll right and everyone will be angry hurt disappointed and frustrated right so i guess you know tell me tell me kind of uh can uh, I, I, I want to move on to a, another area that a lot of, uh, that plagues a lot of nice guys. That's a, a kind of another part to what you were, an, or another example. And that is uh, what Dr. Glover calls covert contracts. So a covert contract, in a covert contract, I, you and I, basically are in some contractual arrangement that you don't know anything about. The contract exists in my mind, although I may even be unconscious of it until something happens. But I'm gonna do something and then you're supposed to do something. And if you do it, I'll be happy. And if you don't do it, I'll be pissed off at you. Okay, how does this work? So um, I, um, I, let's say I'm in a relationship with a woman and I cook her a beautiful dinner. And the contract is, in my mind, she's going to love me for this and maybe give me a, a massage and sex. 
So we have dinner and then she decides, uh, she gets on the phone with a friend and talks for an hour or two and then is tired, takes a bath and goes to bed. I'm furious, furious. Where's my reward for the wonderful dinner that I cooked? She may even leave the dishes in the sink. Now I've got to fucking clean up the, the great, from the great meal while she taught yaks with a friend. Where's my reward? You never oh, asked for it. Uh, that's right. Okay. This is a covert, it's a hidden contract. She never signed on to that bargain. You and just so, assumed that she, she did, but it was never right. actually spoken of. And it is so ubiquitous. You want to hear my favorite example of this? You're driving in a car and you come to a stop sign. Right. And there's another car comes to the another stop sign, same intersection, about the same time. Right. And maybe you got there a little before and you could go, but you're a nice guy. Right. So you wave them through. And as the car is going through, you're looking at the driver to see, does he give you the wave? Thank you. He, you're in a contract with him. Because if he gives you the way, then you feel like a generous person. But if he doesn't, you're, you're pissed off. Fuck you, asshole. You un, right, you, you ungrateful bastard. How great. Right? Uh, here I am. Covert contract. I open the door for a woman. I expect a smile. Not, I'm not doing it to be generous. I'm doing it to get the smile, to get the wave, to get the massage and the sex. That's what I'm doing it for. I'm giving to get. So what what needs to be changed in terms of, do you just need to ask for what you want? Is that sort of the solution to, to that? Or don't give it. Or be, there's th really three solutions as far as I can tell. One is, if you really don't want to give it other than to get, just don't give it because um, uh, you'll be pissed off if you don't get the reward. The second is to make a deal. I'll tell you what, honey, I'm going to cook you an elaborate meal. If you afterwards, um, if you'll give me a massage and we can have sex together. Okay, well, she says yes or no. That's all. She isn't. It's, it's not a horrible deal, and she may be delighted. Um, the th a third way to do it is to just ask for what you want. Honey, you know, tonight, I'm tired, my muscles ache. The th I would love it if you would give me one of your special massages. And you know what? The really special ones that end with us like kind of intimate. That would be great. Um, and in terms of giving, give to give. I've gotten to the place where I'll wave somebody through and I'll turn away because I don't, I don't want to even get involved in the whether or not they, I get thanked for it. If I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to be generous, I'm just going to give it. And that's enough of a reward for me. Right. Uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, a concept maybe building off of this that I was thinking about while you were, while you were sort of uh, talking about this is sort of the, like, and I think this was something that was brought up in, in Dr. Weber's book about kind of being able to put your foot down in terms of if, if you continue sort of just, just giving, giving, giving and not with these sort of covert contracts and then, you know, potentially the, the, you know, the partner sort of realizes, oh, like, maybe, and maybe it's not even a conscious thing, but like sort of subconsciously, they sort of realize, okay, I can just continue taking, taking, taking without ever really giving anything back. It's sort of like, I feel like that, how could they respect you as a man, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, you're just getting walked over at that point. Well, yes, that's right. I agree with you. Um, but it's a it's a funny dance, you know. We all do this dance, and 
Um, eventually, the nice guy in that situation is going to, there'll be something that he wants that he doesn't get, and he'll have a, a big blow up, and then she'll give him something, and then little by little, it go back to where it was. But because where it was, was where they're both comfortable. So uh, they, in a funny sense, he, he's actually getting something and she, she may not respect him, but she's getting something. And so they're in some kind of unholy alliance that can go on for decades. Right, got it. So uh, Dr. Parisha, we're, we're coming up onto the end of the show. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation today. If, uh, if people want to find out like more about your work, um, more about your book, where, where would you direct them to? I have a website, www.drpariser.com, spelled D-R, and then my last name, P-A-R-I-S-E-R, -S -E therapy.com. They can also go to... Um, Amazon and buy the book. It's now it's now available ebook, paperback, and audiobook with an accompanying uh, PDF. So it's available in all all conceivable media at this point in time. And uh, I encourage people. It's not expensive. You know, it's like ten or fifteen bucks, and it's uh, I it's really for people who want to do the transformational journey. Um, it's not a book that you're just going to read and go, whoa, you know, because people do that, they get through a chapter or two and they're done. It's not, that's not what it's for. It's really, uh, as a guidebook, set yourself a, a, a goal of like, do a chapter a month, do the exercises in one chapter in a month or three weeks and, and um, take it nice and slowly and you will have a rich experience and a transformative one. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, thank you. For those of you uh, who enjoyed the show, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel or Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. And you can also find audio versions of the podcast available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and just about anywhere else audio podcasts are available. Uh, Dr. Pariser, again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really enjoyed thank having you, you thank on. Thank you. Yeah, good. I enjoyed being on. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Take care.